absolutely beautiful show that we all just witnessed together. Let's give these guys a round of applause. dramaturg here at the theater at Woodfield, and that means I have a lot of jobs, but mostly it involves um, preparing historical research, like what you see over there in the lobby, to make sure our productions are as accurate to our artist's vision as possible. And also part of my job is moderating talkbacks like this, which, again, thank you for saying. Um, so we're joined tonight by Kelly Galvin, who is with her fifth show? Fourth? Um, fourth, if you can't, twelfth night. Yeah, fifth. So, fourth or fifth, depending on who's asking, um, season with us here at Woods Hill. And we are joined, of course, by our two stars, Caroline and Greg, who this is their very first time here with us, if you can believe it. And we are so grateful that they chose to spend the summer with us. Um, so I'm going to get things started with a few questions for them, and then we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with Kelly for this first question. Um, Something that we're always asking in theater is, why this play now? What is it about a particular piece that makes it so that it should be part of our series programming? So why did you feel that now is the right time to bring Mary's Wedding to the theater of Woods Hill? Um, I've, I read this play about five years ago, and I just really loved it. I, I loved it. It's so imaginative, uh, theatrical in the way that it asks to be played, and it's all about language and those are my, I think that's really where I um, get plugged in mm -hmm. as a director. So I, I knew the play and it was always kind of in my mind. And then when I saw The Barn for the first time, I was like, hey, I want this to happen someday. But the reason that I I really brought it up to, to Alan this year is we were talking about the summer and I, I said, I think it would be really meaningful for a community to get together and be able to feel something together, you know, we've been so separate and so isolated, and this is a play about when events totally outside of our control just completely change the course of our lives, and for Charlie, he loses his life in service of this idea and these choices that are being made by people that he will never meet or never talk to. Um, and that, to me, felt like a way to approach what we've all just experienced um, in our world, and, and to some people that they've lost people, it's been a very extreme time, and for other people it's been simply just the experience of isolation, but but this play, in this play I thought this is a way that we as a communi community can approach thinking about the cost to us, and thinking about what it means to um, have our lives sort of taken over by events outside of our control, and then to also have a chance to imagine a happy ending. And the ending to me is it's certainly bittersweet and in some ways it's extremely tragic. But you know, it, it's so meaningful to me that Mary's life goes on and that I, I believe she can have a, a happy life and, and make more meaning out of her life because of this relationship that she had. So, um, yeah, it just felt like the right time, and certainly it's always felt like the right space. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine yeah. um, the play in a better space. So those things just kind of felt like they aligned in this moment. Yeah, absolutely. And this play walks, what I think is a very interesting line between being grounded in this very historical moment and also having this like dreamy, borderline, almost surreal aesthetic time. So I want to ask all of you, what, what challenges did this present during the artistic conversations navigating these two, this push and pull dynamic of the real and the surreal? Um, the best challenges, that's what I'll say, is it, the script itself, I think, just brilliantly written and rewritten by Stephen Mascotti is is just a piece this is what Corey the percussionist said after working on this for like with us for a day he's like this is a piece of music and I was like yes it's like a score the the way that this piece works is he's written these brilliant transitions from these moments of we're suddenly like plunged into the trench with Charlie on his first night in the line in the writing and it's all a segue from Mary being like, we're at the tea, we're having tea. Oh my gosh, it's raining. The teacups are shattering. There are explosions. Charlie's in the front line, boom, and then we're in there. And these are all written in every single transition in the, brilliantly, and they all like relate to each other in this wonderful way. And 
I don't want to speak too much about this because I think this is like uh, more like maybe your thing to talk about, but just the, the, the character of flowers being Mary mm -hmm. is brilliant in so many ways as a device, as, as um, an opportunity for like this wonderful actor to be performing and as, as just a fun way to work out together in rehearsal. Like, oh, what do we do to move from this moment into this moment and then into the back into the moment we were just in? It's just, it has been so fun and just like joyous to discover and juicy to discover work, dig in, work on these challenges of the transitions and going from one place to the next. Um, yeah, I, I agree that it was that that is the, that was a big challenge and a really worthy and exciting one, I think. And this what Greg just said really describes for me what a lot of our rehearsal process was about was about figuring out those transitions and making that storytelling hopefully clear for the audience. Um, and I love history, so I and in many ways I, I do think that history is asking similar questions as theater sometimes. You know, why do people do what they do? And I, I think that the that to me was a really fun part of this to learn more and to really appreciate the incredible research that is in this play. Yeah, and something interesting that um, we discussed a lot is that um, Lieutenant Flowerdew was actually a real person. He was a historical figure. He did lead that what is considered the last great cavalry charge in history at, at Mariah Wood. Um, so, kind of related to the last question, what was it like for you, Caroline, navigating, um, going between this fictional character, Mary, and this creating the historical figure that is Flowers? Yeah, um, I definitely feel a, res a different kind of responsibility when it's a real person, mm -hmm. um, and, and such a truly incredible, figure, I think, just the more that I learned about him. And I think that Stephen Masakati has just set us up so beautifully to be able to honor his life um, and what he sacrificed. Um, so I, um, I really, I enjoyed learning about him and I appreciate that this play gives us the opportunity to honor his memory. Absolutely. And it it is so beautiful and so stunning. Um, so, kind of going back to what Kelly talked about originally, how do you feel that this space in particular, this barn, lends itself to this play in particular? So, obviously this is not a proscenium theater, there's no curtains, we don't have an orchestra pit, we have pretty minimal sets. How is this different from the kind of acting and directing that you guys usually do? Well, I think that the thing, the space sort of forces you to do is to lean in to the the imaginative ask of the acting and of the audience it's a huge ask because it's like you come in and we set up and we say it's a dream and then we just go we tell you where we're going but if you decide to check out or that you don't want to you know which is totally always the prerogative then it you won't it won't happen the play won't happen so so i love that challenge of leaning into, um, we're all gonna create this together. Like we've done the work of it, but we're gonna ask you to follow with us and to go and to let go, to let go of our literal ideas. Um, and because you know that it's a particular challenge to do the play without lighting, I think if you can imagine being in a traditional theater space, we could say, I'm at the birthday party. Now we're at war and we have strobe lights and you know, it would be, you have more tools. But I really love that this space sort of demands that we lean into the imagination of it. One thing I discovered very early on in directing it, but I've told this story like five times now, but we had our first read through and went very beautifully and then we started staging. And I had this idea that the horse was like a stack of hay bales because I knew the horse is imaginary. Okay, great, it's gonna be on the one end. And we just started working and I was just like, had the most terrible feeling. I just like something felt so wrong to me, and I like had a semi sleepless night. What's happening? What's going on? A lot of the production photos that I'd seen did have elements that stood in for the horse, but something in me was like, just be courageous. The horse is imaginary. Then we can fly and we can move and we can go. So I, I'm really like, pleased with that, and I do think that if I 
hadn't been in this space or hadn't known that we were going to be in here that I might have like found a scenic solution mm -hmm. but this again the space is, is asking us like how much can you imagine how much mm -hmm. can you imagine so that was really fun and also took some courage but I like that you know to kind of like force to take a risk and in a space like this the horse appears <laughs> like yeah. mm -hmm. here you are and the horse we all see it in here yeah it kind of appears and in, in the same way Kelly was just talking about I think without the added maybe spectacle of maybe a traditional proscenium modern theater piece with the sort of bells and whistles as so to speak uh, you're sort of forced I'll say as a performer to lean into the language and create that image with the language of the play and that is also a fun treat yeah. isn't it talk about suspend like not suspending Suspension of disbelief, yeah. like something we talk about all the time at theater, take it to a new level here. Yeah. Kind of. It's also a lot like Shakespeare. I think the yeah. play, this is a, a classical theater, and the play actually has a lot in it that is related to Elizabethan theater. So there's direct address, and you speak right to the audience, and we're all in the same light, and um, it's, it's a language play. The play that's about language and uses language to do, to do everything, which is also just things about Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Alright, so I think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience now. Is there anything anyone's dying to ask? Now's your chance. I, I, I can't look at the two of you and still not cry. <laughs> you just like, like I feel like you like I felt your emotion. I have to disagree with you about doing it anywhere else and having those props. I think because there wasn't any distraction, it was that just the you know, pure relationship mm -hmm. and the story. I just, I, I'm going to cry all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. <laughs> Where are you all from? Um, actually, all three of us are from Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so home base. <laughs> Yeah, or we met all at Shakespeare and Company, which is a, a theater company based there, and we're all company members there, and so we, we have, do have a long working relationship, which I think also is something that you can feel in the play, like there's a, a deep Beautifully friendship. Beautifully, powerfully yeah. done. Deep love. Deep, deep love. love. Yeah, deep love. <laughs> and, and your transition from when you were the, the female to the, to, the, yeah. to the lieutenant or whoever he was, was transformative. Your body language and it, it just it was there was no trouble for me knowing when you were different characters. Oh good, thank you. <laughs> 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 you're like, you're like, you're like, your horse riding. <laughs> <laughs> so so I've never, well, I rode a horse probably once when I was a kid, but, uh, and I had a plan to like go ride a horse for this play. <laughs> never, never happened, but this is also really fun. There's a donkey right outside. <laughs> I have been hanging out with him. His name is T-Bone, and I feed him apples, and he's awesome. <laughs> we know existed and I learned a lot about him but it's still I felt very freed in our process and by the play to come up with a character that um, was our own um, so yeah just like looking around at inspiration and then really thinking about the the relationship the way that he is in the play I think when I sort of landed on what his relationship is with Charlie mm -hmm. I, is I think when it started clicking for me um, that kind of, we've been talking about this, that the play contains many different kinds of love um, and that that love between the two of them as sort of comrades and brothers in arms, once I sort of like started honing in on that, I felt like that was when I kind of, but I was very stressed out about it for a <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's me 
being modest, but she's like an, as you saw, like an incredible physical actor mm -hmm. and like has a giant imagination, probably the biggest imagination of any actor I've ever worked with. And so like your ability to like just hold in your mind who you are and then it just shifts your body in these very subtle ways and it's like yeah. completely believable. So mm -hmm. it's, she's being modest. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, I really do appreciate about the play that, that, that Mary and Flowers are the same. It's, oh yeah. I really, I think it makes it such a fun, juicy, Role. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. It's a great Thank role. You for an Thank you, Stephen. Actresses don't always get to do this, yeah. and it's really satisfying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does anyone else have questions? Yes, please. Yes. First of all, just absolutely fabulous. Um, but um, as parents of some a son that actually went to war in Iraq, which was just the worst time of our life, do you, and not to get political, excuse me, but uh, do you have any idea? how your performance pulls to the sincere gravity of what it's like to send family members to war. Thank you for saying that. Um, I think we thought about that a lot. And, I, and um, I, over the course of this process, learned that my great-grandfather had been in World War I. So I learned, and I found, my mother was like, oh, we have this diary that he wrote. So I, I um, am grateful that I learned about that part of my own family history. It's something that I personally can only imagine, um, having not gone through that experience. Um, but I really, I think it's an important story to be telling and learning about. Um, so I really am honored that you're here. I couldn't stop crying. <laughs> That's great. great. Any Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for your son's service to this country and the world to us. He's um, actually going to meet Fiona in, in the next couple of weeks. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. His, his son. Yeah. He came back safely, and he's got a wonderful family. Thank you. 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 This piece for uh, Charlie is so much about discovery throughout the whole thing I've found and so knowing what happens in the end and starting from a place, especially in the text, knowing what happens, can you speak a little bit to how you went through the discovery through the rehearsal process and performance? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dan, one of my best friends from college. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> You took my first question. <laughs> I was going to ask all about the transitions, and you just jumped right into it. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, yes, okay. Um, so, yeah, it's like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Kind of like, I can't think about the end, even though I, my brain might do it against my will while I'm out there. but. Best thing you can do on stage, I think, and some of the best advice I've gotten is like, take that breath out there. It's so easy to find yourself getting in your head, even on stage. I mean, especially now, to be totally blunt and frank, after a year and a half of not doing this, it is a culture shock in some ways for me to be in front of people speaking out loud and making this kind of eye contact. But um, it, it's that deep breath, and I'm very lucky to have these two as my partners in crime on this massive undertaking, because I can always come back to my scene partner, and that brings me straight back. Um, even if I know where we're headed, I'm like, we're right here. Mm -hmm. And the writing helps in that, too, because the writing brings you straight back, too. That's like the, the whole intention, intentionality. What am I after right now? Right now, what am I after? So your mother, we're talking about your mother. All I care about is your mother. You know, and so uh, I keep bringing myself back into the scene. And the craziest thing is, right at the beginning, Charlie has the line, he has this little intro that's like, this is a dream. It begins at the end and ends at the beginning, which is given to the audience at the very beginning. So it's like, ah. Uh, I don't have to guess how this is going to end. I've seen it, I guess. So you're kind of guessing how things unravel, which is the you know, juicy part of storytelling, too. But um, Kelly said early on in the process, just like, 
do not. From the very get-go, we can't tell the end of the story. The we first can't. time we read it together, we were all crying, like, on page three. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing was, like, very, and it was good. We, like, got out of our system, and then we were like, okay. So it's yeah. a funny play. It's so it's funny. A light, it's, so it's funny. light, and then that's what allows it to go somewhere. But it, it takes discipline yeah. and, like, attention to be, like, not yet, not yet, not yet. Yeah. And enjoy the, the yeah, humor the and the love of it's just a wonderful, goofy, and like joyous relationship. Yeah. With so much like just exciting love in it. So it's like enjoy it until mm-hmm. shit hits the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something Kelly and I talk about a lot is how the humor is what makes the ending hit so much harder. Yeah from an acting perspective and from the audience's perspective too. Like, I think I don't think if we caught those moments of humor in the beginning, if we didn't experience that, we wouldn't have that catharsis at the end. I think the laughter makes us know that they're perfect for each other. And so then when we realize that they can't be together, it's like the, the impact mm-hmm. of what is lost. And then also there is something sort of chemical about laughing and crying. They're very oh, yeah. related. So mm-hmm. you open up with the laughter and then you're Open to be just. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Do you have it? anyone else have any questions? Yes, Andrew. I, this is kind of this question is going to be formed in real time a little bit, so <laughs> forgive me. So okay, he's speaking a... first draft. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, it, do you run the risk with a really attractive characters like this in a situation like this of over identifying with the character and do you try to create a, an emotional separation so you can be objective about what's happening or do you just get into it hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. yes yes i love that question, question. i do too <laughs> <laughs> finding the way to kind of like release and shake it off after afterwards is important even if it's just like for a little while while we were rehearsing we would when we were doing the end we would get through the end and then we would just go and run around the yard <laughs> and then come back and talk about it <laughs> so um and here because we're in this beautiful place i can just go and stand outside and look at the sky and just breathe and then like recheck in with greg and feel so I think um, for me, finding that moment afterward is helpful for me to remind myself that it's not real mm-hmm. in this particular story. Yeah, a ritual is always helpful, beginning or end ritual, song, movement, breath, whatever it is, to, as Caroline was just saying, way in, way out. Uh, but I, and part of the sort of acting training and aesthetic I was trained under in my more recent years is that you are enough. You are enough when you're playing these roles. So when you're after a character, I mean, there are different ways to bring authenticity and more of yourself to the character. Um, And, you know, characters are obviously gonna speak in ways that you don't necessarily speak in your real life or et cetera. Best thing I can do is is breathe, be present with my scene partner, and be authentic. Uh, be myself. Be Greg. Be Charlie. Be Greg being Charlie. <laughs> be Greg being Charlie. <laughs> Acting. Uh, oh, it's so meta. But but there are, have been a few times where I'm like, I'm honoring Charlie by doing this. Mm-hmm. I, I want to honor Charlie in this way. It's worth it to me. Go on. And that challenge is, you know, of course I doubt myself and I have the voices. But honoring Charlie is important. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? I think we have time for one more. Now's your last chance. <laughs> what happens to the to the film? <laughs> <laughs> um, the film will be up on our YouTube channel in a bit. Um, this talk pack will be available so because part of our mission as a company is to keep our programming free for everyone so folks that couldn't come out tonight can experience this show with us.